with everybody eagerly anticipating and waiting for the calendar to turn and being ready to dive in headfirst with full passion and fury into 2021 like it was me diving into Jave Cargill's special place. Thought one last video to close out the year of 2020. And since we're talking about New Year's Eve and that New Year's time, I was looking to do a retro review for today and went to Twitter at OTR Essential. This is the Twitter handle you should follow. And I said, okay, you guys tell me, New Year's Revolution show, do you want 2005, 2006, 2007? Comment 2005, retweet 2006, like 2007. I found it kind of interesting how some folks did not follow the instructions. And they commented and then put 2006 or 2007. That's not, that's not the way it works. <laughs> and actually, technically, I counted your comment about another year as for 2005. So that's on your ass. Um, but I hope you guys enjoy this review of New Year's Revolution 2005. Smash that subscribe button. If it's your first time checking out this channel, do it, do it now! Subscribe or die! It's a cool thing to do. So this show, like, it, it had some train wreck elements at the beginning, and it's not anybody's fault. It just shit happens. Like, you start off with the World Tag Team Championship match. You're there in Puerto Rico in San Juan, and, you know, you've got a traditionally very passionate uh, wrestling fan base for this show, so you're going to work a little bit more with the heel-face dynamic than maybe would in some other places, which, which could be to the benefit. Like, you could do things a little more simplified, a little bit easier, a little more traditional, really make them work. So you got uh, Tomko and Captain Charisma, Mr. Ralph's favorite wrestler of all time in human history, Christian, taking on the tag team champions, William Regal and Eugene! God, I used to love Eugene. A character you absolutely positively could not do in wrestling now. And it's crazy that you were able to do it just fine like 15, 16 years ago. But now, there's no way in hell. Like the, the PC police, the cancel culture, everybody would be so pissed off. Which I always found kind of ironic because in some ways, like, sure, you were making fun of somebody's disabilities. And you were you, in a way, you could say he was mocking somebody. But you were actually also showing somebody uh, with handicaps or disabilities being able to go out and compete at a high level. Like, he was a tag team champion. He was a guy just a few months before had worked at SummerSlam with Triple H. Like, if anything, that's a positive. Yeah, it's a bit of exploitation. I get that. But what isn't in this world anymore, realistically? Um, the Puerto Rico crowd, obviously, was really behind Eugene. It's just a shame they had to call an audible in this match, and it wasn't the only one on this show. As Eugene <laughs> ended up rupturing the poor guy rupturing his patella tendon. I think it was in his left knee. And he was out of action for a few months. Yeah. I mean, they did the best they could. They they didn't ch apparently change the finish of the match. They just had to get creative since, you know, Nick Dinsmore couldn't put any pressure on his left leg at all. He was sitting there hopping around. You know, they had to, they had to grab Tomko's chunks and moon the San Juan crowd and roll them up and one, two, three, and you're out. Like, yeah, awkward way to start a show, and then it gets really awkward because you go back and watch the next match. It's a women's championship between Trish Stratus and Lita. Like, yeah. You know, two legends as you look back in the scope of history, and two of the very best of their times and of all times, you know, in a heated rivalry, and this is going to be like a big payoff and a big blow-off, and... You're expecting to go back in history, like if you didn't know any better about the history of the show, and you're thinking, okay, like I'm going to watch these two ladies go in there and have a really good match, especially for that time in the company's history, as they were sitting there still, and you saw it throughout the night uh, on the pay-per-view, where they're hyping up some of the Diva Search girls, like the Christy Hemmys and the Marias of the world, and I think it was Candice Michelle and others, and they're showing bikinis and the beach at the pool and every damn thing else, like just trying to get people horny, like just softcore porn all the way around. Uh, but this was the second straight match that got audible due to an injury because Lita, early in the match, jumped out of the ring and she ended up tearing her ACL in her left knee. Like, they couldn't get her ready to start this show. You know, you had, a, you had a tag match that could have been really good just because of its simplicity because you could have really worked off of the fact they could get a lot of heat with Eugene and the fans would really be behind Eugene. You can get that hot tag and blow the roof off the place. And instead, he tears a patella tendon. He pulls a Sin Cara. And then Lita sits there and jumps out of the ring and legit tears her ACL in her left knee. My good lord. 
So it's not a surprise. I wonder, I always wondered with this Intercontinental Championship match, if this was actually the plan of what they were going to do with Maven, or they audibled because of the fact that those first two matches went a little bit shorter and they had to, you know, <laughs> change change plans and course correct and adjust as such. Um, Maven versus Shelton Benjamin, like, I love that the crowd was trying to bury Maven in Spanish. And I love even more as the match is getting ready to start that Maven just goes out there and he buries the crowd in both English and Spanish. Like, this was fantastic. Like, I don't remember Maven ever being this fucking good. I always remember Maven being really vanilla, bland, lame. And I legitimately forgot about, like, he had this in him from time to time, and he could do something like this. And again, it works much better with the San Juan Puerto Rico crowd, but it really, really worked. If you don't have to do a bunch of crazy bumps, don't do them. If you can make the crowd feel like they get their money's worth by getting a bunch of heat on this guy that they don't like and then having Shelton Benjamin hit him quickly and easily, not once but twice, then do it. Like, this is fantastic. I loved it. Not every match needs to go a half hour. Modern wrestling could certainly learn from that. Like, this is really, really well done. You're trying to get heat on Maven. You certainly did that. You know, and you're making Shelton Benjamin look like a hero for shutting this clown up not once but twice. Makes him look really good, too. Like, you don't always want your, your villain or your heel going out and struggling to win in a long, drawn-out match. You'd rather sometimes have the heel lose in a quick fashion by surprise, so that way you can still kind of feed into the heel. I wasn't ready! I wasn't ready! This worked. It was really, really fun. Uh, Muhammad Hussan and Jerry Lawler. This is an interesting match because it was Muhammad Hussan's first pay-per-view match, if I remember correctly. JR was going to be in Jerry Lawler's corner, so you were going to get no commentary in this match. I always thought that was interesting, especially since later on when it came time for the main event, they had Coachman come out anyway. It's like, that was weird. Um, but in some ways, you could say it was a logical first pay-per-view opponent for Hassan. Put him in the ring with somebody that knows what the hell he's doing and Jerry the King Lawler. Somebody where you could have Hassan go over, but it's going to get some heat. Like, that makes sense. Uh, it was interesting, weird in a way, to watch a match without commentary. But the whole time this match is going on, you know, the crowd, like, they had moments where it sounded like they were kind of chanting, this is boring, boring. But then they really got into it, especially when we're getting some heat on Lawler. Um, just watching this, though, like the whole time, it really pisses me off because I look at Muhammad Hassan and I say, I don't know if he was ever going to be ready from an in-ring standpoint, but again, how much does that really matter? Like that was a main event world championship gimmick and fuck UPN and fuck WWE for bailing on him and basically pushing Muhammad Hassan entirely out of professional wrestling. Like screw them. You talk about wrestling burials of my lifetime. Like that's one that doesn't get talked about enough. Like... It wasn't just he got yanked on TV or switched to the other show. Like, he got buried. Like, we don't want that character on TV anymore. So they had to send him to developmental, and then they got rid of him. Like, it's, you look at this, and you were so well positioned. Like, you could have figured out a way to have him win the world title from a Kurt Angle. And then you build up to a WrestleMania angle between him and John Cena. Like, WrestleMania 22. Like, there's so much money that could have been made with this gimmick, especially with the timing and everything. And we absolutely got none of it. Like, it was lame. It sucks. And it still pisses me off to this day to think about it. Uh, another one that pisses me off, too, like, going back and watching this again, um, Kane and Snitsky. It's not my fault. It was all your fault. You suck. But this storyline that fed this was really stupid. Really, really stupid. I hate miscarriage and abortion angles in wrestling. Because what's the payoff? Like, what's really the payoff? It's kind of cheap. It's kind of sleazy. It's a lazy way to get heat. It's just, and if anything, you'll you'll have fans that watch, like, it's going to connect with them because they've experienced that one way or another, and it's not going to connect in a good way that's drawing you money. Like, there's heat, heat that makes you a lot of money, and heat that is go away, fuck off heat, and I don't want anything to do with it. There was never a payoff to this. Just brings a painful, dumb shit. And you knew the whole time Kane was winning this. Tombstone, blah, blah, blah. Like, Match is forgettable. The whole angle, the wedding and marriage to Lita, forgettable. Lita being pregnant and then having a miscarriage only then later on in the year or the next year she's sitting there having her almost later on the same year. This is 2005. I'm sorry. Uh, having live sex celebrations in the ring with Edge and all this other shit and all of that. Like, fuck that. And besides, it was time to get to the main event anyways. 
the Elimination Chamber, six-man for the vacated World Heavyweight Championship. You had Edge, Y2J, The Invisible Man, Randy Orton, Batista, and Triple H. And, you know, in arguably the best thing he ever did with the company, Shawn Michaels, the king of the special guest referee. I kid, I kid, I kid. Or only somewhat. I kid, I kid. Not as much as you think. I kid, I kid. But son of a bitch, how many times was this guy a guest referee over the freaking years? Uh, <laughs> like, you could really see here in the beginnings, even back then in 2005, you could see where they were going. They're going Batista and Hunter at Mania. And you're assuming Batista's winning the Rumble. I mean, that was a guarantee. But you knew they were going Batista, Triple H. They were going to break off Evolution at that point because you'd already broken off Orton on his own. Now the time is ready. And you could even hear it with this Puerto Rico crowd. Like, Batista was really over. The people at the time were behind Batista. Everybody was ready for Batista to get his comeuppance over Triple H and take that freaking title away from Triple H. People were fiending for it and ready for it and waiting for it. And obviously they weren't going to get it here because, you know, God's got to do what God's got to do after all. But, I mean, it, it was clearly obvious. And it's fun to go back and watch and you see that development. Because you remember earlier on in 2004, it was all about Randy, 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 Randy. And then all of a sudden, as soon as it seems like, as soon as he beat the Invisible Man for the world title at SummerSlam, like, it instantly became, it's not Orton anymore, it's about God. So that way we can serve it up to Batista at WrestleMania. Fascinating stuff. But as much as you might talk about this was a good Elimination Chamber match, and it certainly was, and you say the crowd was really into it, and they certainly were, um, you know, I look at this with a different thought. Like, it all came down to Randy Orton, former Evolution member, Batista, Evolution member, Triple H, leader of Evolution, Shawn Michaels, <laughs> special guest referee, best friend of Triple H. You could make the case, and I certainly will hear, that this, to me, at the beginning of 2005, you had this weird, you had this interesting dynamic of both the Fortunate Four were really starting to get into place, and if you're not familiar with the Fortunate Four, that's Cena, Orton, Edge, and Batista. But then even more so than that, you have a separate subset of what was going on. And I really look at this as almost as like the birth of the Breakfast Club. I know the Cena wasn't on the show, and he wasn't there, but... He didn't have to be there for the Breakfast Club to come into being. Think about what I just said. It was all about Randy Orton, Batista, and how they were going to get to Triple H winning the title that he held before that had since been vacated, so that way he could get it back, so that way he could add another World Championship win to his resume because on everything that is the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley, that's how God makes miracles happen, folks. Like, this was well done. You had... Orton eliminate Batista with the low blow into the RKO as Triple H doesn't really get up to break up the pinfall when it appears that he could, so that way he can eventually beat Orton with the help of both Batista and Ric Flair. I guess it was well done. And it really set the table well for what was going to happen at the Royal Rumble and then eventually what was going to happen at WrestleMania in the next couple of pay-per-views when Batista beat that ass. But like when I look at this show, like it was an ass show. You know, Maybe it was a surprise star when you go back and watch it, but had a couple of train wrecks early just because of injuries that are unfortunate for sure. Um, but this main event was good for sure. It's the only thing really, truly going worth back and watching. But I love it because it was the birth of the Breakfast Club to me. Like the New Year's Revolution, the resolution of 2005 was, Strike the numbers, boys! Gonna make it about us! Myself and eyes. And wheeze is us and eyes. Whew. I mean, that's Breakfast Club business. The last three are Orton, Batista, and Triple H. And it all ties into Triple H. And Shawn Michaels being the special guest referee, how it still all ties into Triple H. Like, y'all folks can believe in whatever holy specters you want. You should believe in the power of Paul Levesque to make miracles happen. I'm just saying. So that was New Year's Revolution 2005. <laughs> it was all about putting the world strap back on Triple H so that way him and Batista could do some business in Mania and afterwards. Praise God!